there, everyone. Uh, I'm back, Alyssa, uh, she, her pronouns. I'm a junior at Carmel High School, and I'm going to be introducing Dr. Rachel Kramer today. Uh, Dr. Rachel Kramer has extensive training in family-based treatment and providing family-based treatment informed care to youth and their families in an inpatient medicine setting. Uh, her research interests range from evaluating protective factors against eating disorder development, understanding factors that impact eating disorder treatment and symptom severity, and studying the impact of eating disorders on families. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rachel Kramer. Thanks so much, Alyssa, and just um, really pleased to be here. I've really been enjoying myself here at the conference, um, and a big thank you to the AIM Lab youth and everyone who's been involved. I just think this is an incredible organization, so really honored to be speaking here today. Um, okay, so I have no disclosures to report, and I wanted to just introduce a slide here that talks a little bit about the statistics around eating disorders. 9% um, of the U.S. population at some point in their lifetime um, may develop an eating disorder, and we see eating disorders in all ages, ranges 5 to 80, um, that all races, um, ethnicities can experience eating disorders, all gender identities, sexuality. Um, I think important things to note is that eating disorders really come with a significant cost um, for families, for society, and this is part of a study that was done by Striped and um, AED. You're welcome to kind of look it up. Um, I think there's like a hashtag that's on the bottom, but um, I think another thing that's really important to note, and I'm going to be speaking specifically about eating disorders with adolescents, is that eating disorders have the second highest mortality risk um, among pediatric psychiatric conditions second to opiate use disorder. Um, and so oftentimes we'll see patients who have um, low heart rate, um, electrolyte imbalances, um, a variety of different medical concerns that result um, from malnutrition, and so I wanted to kind of preface that a lot of the evidence-based treatments that we recommend really focus on improving nutrition, first and foremost, before everything else, because we know once someone is kind of better nourished, they, they tend to do better and can kind of recover, and recovery is definitely possible. Um, so the DSM-5 has a variety of different eating disorders. I'm not gonna go into what the definitions are, but it's basically, um, we're basically looking at, um, sorry, I hear a little bit of an echo and I'm getting a little distracted, but it's basically anyone changing their eating behaviors or kind of trying to comp uh, compensate for what they're eating. And it can be related to body image, um, but it can also just be related to other fears. Um, so our fit is a newer diagnosis that I won't go over. I just wanted to kind of point out that eating disorders come with a variety of co-occurring psychiatric conditions, so depression, higher risk for suicide, anxiety, and obsessionality, substance use problems, higher rates of trauma, and then in ARFID, um, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, um, anxiety, OCD, ADHD, autism spectrum um, as well. Um, so there's a lot of eating disorder myths out there. Um, one is that eating disorders only happen to girls. Um, and this is not the case. We see that while the rates are maybe two times the amount that uh, males also experience eating disorders. Eating disorders are not just a phase. Um, when someone kind of develops an eating disorder, different changes that occur related to malnutrition really make it hard for someone to just um, snap out of it. Um, and so it should be taken really seriously. Um, so if someone's saying that they're really struggling with eating or, or body image and they're um, experiencing an eating disorder, that it's not just going to go away, that we really need to provide support. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, eating disorders are not about attention. Um, in fact, a lot of patients that I have worked with feel a lot of shame about having an eating disorder and are very reluctant to actually share what they're going through. And so, you know, even if it might, it, it's definitely not, they're not trying to restrict or engage in behaviors to, to be provocative. This is something really hard. They're experiencing a lot of fear. Um, and so not an attention-seeking behavior at all. Um, eating disorder behaviors um, do not happen just in upper middle class white girls. Um, we see eating disorders in a variety of SES, ethnicities, races. Um, I could spend a whole hour talking about how I think a lot of what relates to it is just underreporting and, and who gets access to care, and that's why we're not seeing or not having a great understanding of who has an eating disorder. 
Um, eating disorders are not caused by the media, although I have to say um, there's a lot of images out there, right, where we can start to compare how we look to these images, a lot of diet culture, a lot of appearance-based um, messaging that can also make us feel worse about our bodies, can make us think that we're not eating well, right, and then have us kind of fixate on food and bodies in ways that are not um, necessarily conducive to our health. Um, there's also the myth that people do not recover from their eating disorder, and this is not true, especially with adolescents, um, where we know people who receive treatment um, and are kind of detected early can do really, really well. And I can say for a fact that I've worked with people who have fully recovered from their eating disorder, and it is possible. Um, parents are not to blame, so previous beliefs within the field were that we needed to work with individual patients and kind of separate them from their family. Um, and this is actually not the case. We know that all different uh, patients from all over can develop an eating disorder that is not related to caregiver style that predicts an eating disorder. And actually, caregivers are some of the best supports for recovery. Um, and then um, that eating disorders have like one body type. And um, you cannot judge whether someone has an eating disorder by looking at someone just um, on the street. We would never know. So causes of eating disorders and who gets them, again, kind of want to reiterate all genders, ages, ethnicities, and races, sexual orientations, body types develop an eating disorder. And that eating disorder risk is multifactorial. And so the research is still kind of amassing, but we see that 40 to 80% of what causes an eating disorder is genetic. And then there's heritable personality traits that might put someone at greater risk. Um, that there's social factors uh, as well, right? So again, thin ideal internalization, this focus on eating healthy, um, a lot of weight stigma um, can also contribute, and then a significant focus on weight. So having a negative experience where a doctor has told you to lose weight, um, having, you know, have, being teased, all of those can kind of be predictive. And then I think that the reason why we had this misbelief that um, it was only cisgender white female who developed an eating disorder is, is related to under detection. So how we're assessing for eating disorders and then who is presenting or who gets access to care. And so it's really important that we're consider considerate of that. Um, has anyone heard of the Ansel Keys research study that was done in the 1940s? I see a show of hands. Okay, so some of you are familiar with this. Not the most ethical study, um, but what they did is they took 36 conscientious objectors to World War II, um, and instead of going off to war, they participated in a research study where they lost a significant portion of weight, or, or they were not given enough nutrition for what their body needed. That's, I think, the most important piece um, for, the, for about six months. And they really didn't have any mental health concerns prior to starting the study, but what they found over time is that these men developed symptoms that kind of looked like an eating disorder. They were more depressed, they were more anxious, irritable, they had a hard time sitting still. They started to cut their food into small pieces, started to um, read recipe books, and kind of do a lot of the things that we might see when someone is struggling with an eating disorder. I think if they were to do the study now, they would be read, like watching all the TikTok videos about um, watching food preparation, all of that, and, but what we know is that as these men were re-nourished, all of those symptoms resolved. And so what we know is malnutrition has a significant impact just on how people can respond and um, in terms of mood, anxiety, um, and just how they're feeling. Um, we also know that when someone has an eating disorder, they develop more cognitive infle inflexibility around nutrition um, and perseverate, and the brain reward circuitry around nutrition kind of changes as well. And so while someone without an eating disorder might look at food and say, yes, this is great, and the brain system is saying, this is awesome, right, it's firing, someone with an eating disorder actually experiences significant fear when presented with nutrition. Um, and we also live in a culture, right, that reinforces weight loss and focuses on weight, which makes, I think, eating disorder recovery feel challenging as well. So thin ideal internalization or muscle ideal internalization, um, weight stigma, um, this belief that you need to be a certain weight or need to be on a, you know, um, to be healthy, and then this obesity epidemic, right, which makes us feel fearful about <laughs> our weight and that it's, you have to be a certain weight to be healthy, which we're, we know through research isn't true, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But because of some of the cognitive changes um, 
that occur with malnutrition, um, because of some of the medical risk, family-based treatment was really set up to help teens with an eating disorder recover. Um, and so the parents step in really because we want to reduce medical risk that's associated with eating disorders. Um, it's really hard. You can't really recover from an eating disorder without getting the nutrition that you need first. Um, so it's a pragmatic approach. It's a whole family versus an individual treatment approach, although you do work with a teen and as someone starts to get better, there's more and more of an individualized approach. It tends to be 12 to 20 sessions over six to 12 months. Um, it's for outpatients who are medically stable, and so it's really important that as you start care that you see a medical provider to make sure that you are stable, um, and then it's conducted in three phases. But first, we have to detect an eating disorder, and so we really want to pay just attention to changes in eating patterns or what, how someone is um, feeling. So are they skipping meals, eating in isolation? Are they eating in different ways than they first started? Um, are there weight changes, or is there more focus on body image? Are they looking in the mirror more, um, reporting, not feeling great? And I think what I really want to emphasize, and if there's one thing that you all take home <laughs> from this talk, is that um, it's the weight loss or the amount of, or the rate of weight loss, or the amount of eating disorder behaviors not even related to weight loss that put someone at greater medical risk. And so it's really important that we're not just judging someone based off of you know, what their weight is when they come in for treatment. Um, so again, medical clearance is really important. In the initial session, we really work on um, understanding how the eating disorder, ED for eating disorder, has been impacting the patient and the family. Um, what is it getting in the way of? I like to do a lot of um, different values work, kind of within um, pulling in an act a little bit. But this idea of, you know, are they not able to focus in school? Are they not? socializing with friends. Are family meals really stressful because the parent's saying, hey, you need to eat more, and the teen's like running away. Um, so it's really just talking about the medical risk, encouraging that nutrition is the most important. FBT has a few tenants that we try to incorporate during care, and so the first is that we're agnostic to the cause of eating disorders, right? Research shows that caregivers are not the cause, and it's not gonna necessarily help us help families improve someone's eating, and so the goal is to really focus on the here and now and being pragmatic, what went well this week. Um, we really work to increase self-efficacy for caregivers and teens, what went well, again, because I think if we're feeling really stressed and overwhelmed, it's hard to really intervene and provide support. Um, and the therapist is a consultant to the family um, who's an expert to their kid. While I might know um, how an eating disorder makes a teen start to think, it's be, um, it's really the parents who've been really successful at raising their kid thus far, and so we work together as a team to help the youth. Um, and we separate the patient from their eating disorder, right, because oftentimes when someone's feeling stressed, right, if <laughs> I think of the example of like someone asking me to jump out of a, a plane, I'm like scared of heights, right, I would probably try to do everything that I could to avoid doing this, right, and so when someone has an eating disorder, that fear is just as high, right, and so they might endorse a lot of fear, they might report a lot of feeling angry, right, that here we are saying you need to eat. And so, you know, it's not the teen who wants to be disobedient or upset, right, but it's the eating disorder that's making them respond this way. Um, and that nutrition is medicine. Um, so that's the main focus of treatment. Uh, I could go through the phases in more depth. I'll just really be, be brief around this. But phase one is really having parents kind of take over and really support the youth as they're working on improving nutrition and normalizing eating behaviors. Um, and so it's really troubleshooting meals, kind of saying how can we kind of introduce a variety of foods that we know are okay and not just letting the eating disorder choose safe or unsafe foods. Expanding variety is what I mean. Again, increasing self-efficacy and then coming up with ways to help teens cope. And so oftentimes I'll incorporate DBT strategies and different coping skills before, during, and after the meals. Also encouraging family meals together because we oftentimes also say that we want youth to be eating meals with their family and have that support. Um, so sometimes it's playing games during meals, sometimes it's doing something mindful before to reduce anxiety. When someone has kind of been doing better, they're more medically stable, we start to move to phase two where we return autonomy back to the teen um, and we continue to, to kind of assess medical stability through weights, through medical visits. Um, and then phase three is really trying to focus on and getting the teen back to where they want to be, right? If they've missed out on sports, because oftentimes, sometimes medical teams will say, hey, let's hold off on it. It's really getting back to their lives. 
Um, if there's other comorbid conditions, this is also a time where we work on um, kind of helping them with OCD, anxiety, depression um, as well. I wanted to point out that um, I think it's really important that we focus and, and try to combat weight bias and stigma. And so we know that um, through research that patients who have histories of higher weight, right, which can be perfectly healthy, right, but there's this medical belief that there's a certain perfect weight we need to be right, um, will, can re uh, report, excuse me, greater eating disorder symptoms, anxiety, and depression. Um, I'd like to preface that experiencing greater teasing is a predictor of eating disorder symptomology. And so I think it's important that we assess for this because as we're asking someone to improve their nutrition, I think it's really important that we're having this conversation and kind of helping someone feel more empowered um, for recovery. Um, we also know that when someone presents with atypical, we want to be mindful of treatment delays. Um, so sometimes um, research has shown that um, if we're looking at weight just at presentation, we are missing. Um, many patients, and so we want to be mindful of assessing eating disorder behaviors generally versus just what someone's weight is when they present. Um, so we reduce treatment delays. Um, and then I think it's also important that we set appropriate goal weights. And so um, if someone is presenting, we really look at their growth chart throughout their life, um, and we're basing our weight recommendations on someone's actual growth chart, right? Just like um, if we were to look at normal heart rate, we'd want someone's heart rate to kind of get back to where it was normally. Um, I'm just going to try to be mindful of time. <laughs> um, I think just in terms of assessment for eating disorder behaviors, I think that we want to be inclusive, right? So not everyone's going to say, I want to look um, like this or I want to look like that. And so different people can have different body ideals. So making sure that we're understanding, you know, is this driven by thin ideal internalization, different cultures, um, might prefer to be have a curvy yet slim appearance. Um, and then eating behaviors might look differently too. And so I know with some athletes that I've worked with have reported um, you know, engaging in different behaviors than, um, so for instance, like more exercise or eating a certain way. I feel like that wasn't the most clear, but. Other myths and corrections that I'd like to, to highlight is that weight, there's this belief that weight is associated with medical consequences. Um, and that is not true, and that actually some research suggests that what explains a lot of the medical risk is actually the weight stigma and bias that patients experience um, versus weight in and of itself. Um, and so, um, of course, this is not the 100% answer, but I think it's important to think about that, and that I think another thing is that um, there, uh, the belief that everyone should be kind of at this average weight um, is not true, that everyone needs to follow their own developmental growth curve. And I have a Dalmatian in a lab up here, right, because we wouldn't expect a Dalmatian to, to weigh the same as a lab or vice versa. Um, everyone kind of has their own um, body that they're supposed to be, and so we really want to, again, focus on the individual. Um, so how can we support youth with an eating disorder and be weight bias free just generally? So I think we want to avoid comments on weight and shape um, and talk even about the general population. So I think it's very common for people to say, oh, you look great, or oh, you've lost weight, or whatever. And I think this can perpetuate this belief that weight loss is good and that there's a certain weight we should be. And so it's really focusing on what someone's traits are. Um, we also live in a culture, right, that talks about eating a certain way. And so I think another way to kind of refocus is to focus on food as fuel for fun, and it's not good or bad, um, right? We go to celebrations, we enjoy all these different foods, and that it's really not about, there's no one good food or bad food. Um, that our weight is not a choice, um, just like our eye color, height, um, our weight is kind of genetically determined. And then we, to understand that we live in a culture that makes, make, that makes liking our body really difficult, right? I think the messages are, you should change your body if you don't like it, right? And so it makes it really hard to be self-accepting. Um, especially when I think only certain body types are presented in the media. So what do you do if you're concerned if anyone has an eating disorder? I think it's okay to ask if the individual is okay to share resources. 
Um, you know, I think I've heard of a resounding theme about being available and being non-judgmental throughout our talks. Um, Ways to help with body image, I think we can try to focus away on just appearance and focus on traits that a person has control over um, and values to not engage in fat talk. So does anyone know what fat talk is? It's like making comments like, oh, I shouldn't be wearing this. This outfit looks too tight or I look fat in this outfit, right? I think one of us can start to say that and then I don't know if you notice, right? It creates this cascade of comments about our appearance where we start to feel worse about ourselves and research actually shows that engaging in this kind of conversation actually increases uh, body dissatisfaction significantly um, and it doesn't necessarily help people feel better. So I oftentimes try to change the subject or, or kind of provide a compliment not related to body image. I think self-compassion can be really helpful as well. Um, so Kristen Neff, uh, introduce this concept, but it's this idea that we're kind of all experiencing some so common humanity. We all kind of experience body image dissatisfaction. It's like talking to ourselves like we're talking to a friend, um, right? We all, I, I don't know how many people, like I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hands in the room, right? But I would venture to guess that we've all had days where we haven't necessarily liked what, how we've you know, looked or an aspect of our body, and so it's kind of a collective experience, and so kind of connecting to that. And then looking at our body functions versus just what it does, right? And so instead of paying attention to our body as an object, thinking about what our body allows us to do, right? It allows, it allows us to go hike. It allows us to experience this really incredible conference. It allows us to, to talk with our friends. And then there's some resources on the... Um, on the right <laughs> that I rec recommend. The Body is Not an Apology is a great book that talks about how we shouldn't apologize for what our body is, right? This is our body. When we look at babies, they get really excited about exploring their feet and their hands, right? Like, they're not apologetic, uh, not apologetic at all, right? They're, that's just their body and they're excited about it, but over time we start to question our bodies. Living with your body and other things you hate um, is a great um, tool for just, um, it has more ACT versus FBD approaches, but it's helpful with body image. And then if you haven't checked out the podcast maintenance phase, it focuses specifically on combating weight stigma, and I think it's a really great resource. Um, I have some references here. And then um, When Your Teen Has an Eating Disorder is a really helpful book for caregivers who are receiving FBT. Um, and then um, I created a, I'm so proud of myself, I created a uh, QR code with resources and figured out how to do it. So if you want specific resources, um, related to eating disorder treatment and support or body image. Um, that is a QR code that has a bunch of recommendations from my team. Um, so I've been wanting to be, I have a little bit of time, so happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Can you hear me? Ah, okay, there you go. You were mentioning that um, one of the ways that we can support our youth is ask, right? And I think it can also be very tricky to ask in a way that's not gonna be judgmental or making, I'm just curious if you could share with us ways that we can ask that don't end up doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I think first it's just like validating and sharing that you're, you're caring and that maybe you're even like not sure the best way to ask and that you, but you are concerned. And so I think kind of prefacing it that way, I mean, I think it depends, like I think it, the, the situation could, could vary too, right? Like I could see being a teacher being different than if you're a parent, but I mean, I think it's finding it a good time to kind of sit down with them and say, hey, like I noticed this. Um, and I think it's just being open and, I think sometimes I, I even notice wanting to go to problem solving mode, but sometimes it's just about listening and kind of saying, okay, um, this is what I'm hearing. Um, that, I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah. Run, 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 run. Get my steps. 
I know that for youth that are athletes, there's a high prevalence of eating disorders, and so are there any special considerations when thinking about young athletes? Totally, I mean, I think um, the competitive nature of a sport can, you know, I think it's, it's also, you know, you can compare yourself to other, um, other people on your team, and so, I, you know, I think it's having a coach that kind of understands that, like, someone's health is really important too, and so, you know, I've worked with students who are athletes, and. You know, it's 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 tough because I think oftentimes I'll say, hey, until your eating disorder is better, we want you to kind of hold off. But so it's really getting the whole team, or not the team, but the coach involved, and kind of work, working with the coach so that they can support um, teens, but also just making sure that they're following with the medical provider and that parents feel like the teen is able to participate um, and still get the nutrition that they need. Um, yeah. So when we look at family-based treatment, um, just from the presentation, I'm assuming that it's mostly parent and child, um, but are there other extended considerations like involving like, you know, siblings, cousins, um, because you know, those are also loved ones in our lives? And my second question would be also, it seems like family-based treatment requires getting the entire family through the door willing to help their child. Um, but what happens if you can't do that, if they come from a culture where there is heavy stigma on eating disorders or where the concept of an eating disorder doesn't even exist? Those are really great questions. Um, and I think you bring up a good point. I kind of didn't, I could have gone over FBT a lot more. Um, and one thing I didn't emphasize is that actually when you have sessions, you typically ask that the siblings also come. Um, because oftentimes they can, well, parents are saying, you need to eat more, right? The siblings can be the ones who give their, their sibling the hug and kind of distract them in ways that caregivers, you know, it's just different, right? The relationship is different. And so I also think uh, siblings are greatly impacted by having a, a sibling with an eating disorder. And so that's another important piece is that then we can also provide support and education to the sibling so that they don't feel like they're doing anything wrong. I've had a lot of siblings say, I don't even know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't want to upset my sibling. And so it's a, it's a way to kind of get all family kind of involved. and. Um, I think, you know, to the stigma piece, I think we really try to, to really emphasize that it's, it, it's a medical condition, right, that, that you know, it's, this is not about how this person is thinking and that, um, I think, and also emphasize that caregivers are the best support, right, like it's gonna, it, that's, they're going to be the ones who can really help their, their kid, um, but if, if we're really struggling to kind of get the whole family on board, then there are other evidence-based treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced, where it is a little bit more individualized, where we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that, but yeah. Thank you. I just had a comment on the question that was asked over there, and that was a really good question because a lot of the time that, that makes the student uh, struggle to open up is that language, knowing what to say, and also the, the stigma from certain words. We talk a lot about mental health stigma, but from what I've noticed as a school counselor, a big part of it is those buzzwords, like eating disorder, depression, things like that. So I think it helps to not to uh, just start with that. Just notice uh, the changes, know that you're coming from a helping perspective, and not put so much emphasis on the disorder. Because that's important, like in our profession too, that we're not diagnosing that exactly. So focusing just on the student and the uh, solutions instead of just what the diagnosis is and getting hyper focused on that is really helpful too. Thanks for adding that. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna. Oh, we're gonna have. Okay, these are the last two questions because then everyone we need to move on. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't. Okay, good. What's your name again? I'm uh, Brielle. Brielle. Okay, everyone, this is Brielle. Um, okay, so I wondering, I um, I have a lot of friends with like really bad mental health. That's kind of what got me into interested in this, and I also have a hard time when someone tells like ends up um, like wanting to share about it, which is brave enough. I have a hard time like specifically responding. And I worry that if someone's going to come to me with this situation, obviously it's not my fault, like my, not my job to be their therapist, but as a support, um, how, what's, what would you suggest um, be the best way to respond to someone c like coming out to be having an eating disorder to you? Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you recognize, right, that like, you know, it's not your job to, to necessarily fix it. And it, as a caring friend, you want to be able to be supportive and have the resources. 
um, you know, I think it can be hard to kind of share with someone. So I think it's first and foremost just like recognizing it and say, hey, I'm here to help. You know, I've had some situations where teens have said, okay, I'm really concerned. My friend doesn't even recognize this. And then they've gone to kind of say, I want to talk with your parents too. And it's been a conversation. Um, you know, I think sometimes sharing meals can be really helpful or kind of just asking, what can I do to help? Um, because then they can kind of say, well, like, I'm, I feel scared to eat and it would be helpful to have someone. Um, and just, I think, helping the teen see that they're more than just what their body is, right? And kind of helping them see themselves as a whole person. Um, and then there's resources on the QR code that I think, you know, I think just sharing other resources, but really trying to, to focus on body positivity or neutrality and kind of focusing on that too. Um, I kind of wonder what sort of feedback or guidance you can give to medical professionals uh, or caregivers' parents regarding overseeing and monitoring somebody's weight. Like you go to a doctor's appointment and now you're given the option of being, have, you know, somebody taking your weight or not. And so in terms of monitoring weight and health, how do we do that still, yet also being aware and sensitive to the fact that this is a sensitive issue to a lot of people, having the mm -hmm. weight being tracked. Mm -hmm. um, and from a clinical perspective, how do you also uh, address that, knowing they have people that are sensitive about getting their, their measurements or their weights? And, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I think it's that's a really great question. And I think there's there's multiple layers to it, especially as I think you know, there's been some initiative to track weight in BMI um, within the medical field. Um, you know, I think that sometimes it's thinking about what's gonna work for the individual. Do they look at their right weight? Sometimes I think it's better to just kind of look at what their trend has been, right? And if they've been historically healthy at a certain percentile their whole life, it doesn't, they don't need to lose weight, right? And, and so I think the other important thing is to kind of trust or, or look historically at where someone's been. Um, I think it's not making comments about weight. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is if if there's been comments like you need to lose weight, like I can't, that's really stressful for any, like I think just because, I think without giving specific information and guidance, I think it can be really tricky and I think it can be taken the wrong way. And so oftentimes I think my biggest suggestion would be to find a provider who is, you know, confident at, at working with someone who's not gonna ex have weight stigma and kind of look at someone individually and what their growth trajectory has been. But I think it's also really being mindful about not focusing just on weight, but really assessing what someone's behaviors are. And, you know, because we also know that like dieting is really ineffective um, and that it actually leads to greater eating disorder behaviors and worse, he worse health. Worse health. Um, and we also know that the things that kind of help control eating behaviors is normalizing eating, right? Which has nothing to do with weight. And so it's really looking at behavior um, and not weight. <laughs> I hope that helps, but I think it's just providing a prov like finding a provider that that can kind of speak that language. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Yeah, Thank you so much. Good <laughs>